I'm excited to continue our series called The Grace Effect today, where we're working our way through uh, the New Testament book of Galatians. Uh, but y'all, how amazing is it that today we get to see pictures of eight baptisms that took place in Madrid, Spain, because you're giving and you're praying because you helped send Antonio and Daniela. So thank you guys. Man, it's such a joy that God would use us to, to work in a people that we've never met. And so, man, I'm just delighted and want to say thank you guys for your investments that helped make that happen. Now, today we're going to continue walking through the New Testament book of Galatians. And if you haven't been here over the past couple of weeks, um, it's called The Grace Effect uh, because Galatians is a book that's had kind of an outsized influence on the world around us. It, it, it happened not just in the life of Martin Luther, if you were here when I nerded out for a bit, and I'll probably do it again, uh, but it also happened like in terms of the world, the, the Reformation. Uh, we see that the grace of God profoundly impacts people. And it was true of the Apostle Paul as well. We're going to see that in the Apostle Paul's life, he was headed in one direction and, and God uh, transformed that in a moment, totally changed his direction, um, altered the course of his life, and then used the Apostle Paul in profound ways. Now, the Apostle Paul is writing this letter to the churches. There's a group of churches in the region of Galatia to correct false teachers. These false teachers had begun uh, teaching them that they needed to add to the gospel of Jesus. It's, it's Jesus plus obeying the, the Jewish law, and that's what's going to save you. That's what's going to keep you. That's what's going to give uh, God pleasure with your life. And the Apostle Paul is writing to correct that. Now, as all false teachers will do, they were trash-talking those who taught the truth. They were actually speaking against Paul, and they were accusing him, saying, Well, I know the Apostle Paul has come into this region. He's preached the gospel to you, but he's preaching a manipulated gospel. Uh, he heard that gospel from the disciples, likely was their accusation. And he's kind of manipulating that to win favor with men. Now, we see that in verse 10 of Galatians chapter 1. And, and where Paul answers their accusation against him. He says, For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. Now, Paul uh, doesn't list it here, uh, but we have in the Scriptures, we get to see what the Apostle Paul was willing to give up in order to take the gospel to the nations. And it was significant. So this is a list that Paul gives us in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He says, Five times I have received the 39 lashes from the Jews. So when he, when he says 39, they literally would take a whip and they would bind uh, Paul's hands, usually around a post of some sort, in order to kind of spread his back out. And 39 lashes just flaying his body open. He's like, five times I've received that from the Jews. He's like, and if that wasn't enough, three times I've been beaten with rods. So we've gone from, from a whip now to rods. And he says, I was even stoned. And, and not the kind of stone you might be thinking, but rather groups of these Jewish leaders would gather around the Apostle Paul with rocks about the size of baseballs. And they would, they would pummel him with these rocks. And they didn't stop until they thought he was dead. But the Apostle Paul continues just saying, hey, am I really doing this about me? Is it because I want to be liked? He continues on. He says, three times I've been shipwrecked on journeys to take the gospel to people that I haven't heard. Paul nearly died of hunger and thirst and exposure to the elements. Now, what's crazy about the Apostle Paul is to think about his previous life. I mean, he endured all of this um, for the sake of the gospel, but his previous life was pretty cushy. He was a religious ruler, which is a great place to be. That's something that if, if you were living in the first century, you probably would have wanted to be a religious ruler, in particular if you were a Jew, because they had a good life. He would have had plenty of money. He would have been well known. He would have been influential and powerful. People would have known Paul's name, and they would have wanted to listen to what he had to say. And yet something profound happened in the life of the Apostle Paul that changed everything in his life. So he left the good life of the first century behind and instead followed Jesus even to the point that he would endure all of this suffering to take the gospel to people. So the question I want to ask and then answer is, what 
changed? Like, what happened, had to happen in Paul's life that he would leave all that behind and then pursue a life of suffering for the sake of the gospel? And as I asked that question about the Apostle Paul, I would ask that question to you. What would it take in your life for you to leave the good life, the American dream? The, may, I don't know if your life's cushy or not. I don't want to accuse you, right? But your life that you're pursuing now, the things that you're seeking, what would it take in your life for you to leave that behind and instead to live the rest of your life for the sake of the gospel that other people may hear? So we're going to look at three things that happened in the Apostle Paul's life that transformed him and three things that need to happen in order for us to be transformed as well. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Galatians chapter 1. We're going to begin in verse 11. And he begins to reveal this to us here in this verse. He says, For I would have you know, brothers, remember, writing to the churches in Galatia, they kind of heard accusations about him, about the validity of his apostleship and the validity of the gospel that he was preaching. He says, for I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. Now, this is a really important point for us as believers. And if you're not, you're here and you're not a believer, this is the claim that Christians would hold about the scriptures. That this is not from man. He says, I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. He's like, the gospel, this good news that I've given my life for, that I've walked away from everything in order to share this, he's like, this isn't man-made. It's not like a clever theory that we can organize around as a society that will make us better. He's like, I received this from Jesus Christ himself. Like, he shared this good news of the gospel with me. Now, for the Apostle Paul, he'd had an encounter with Christ. We're going to see it in just a little bit, where Jesus came and revealed himself like in person to the Apostle Paul. Now, Paul had worked very hard in Judaism. He knew the books of the law in the Old Testament. Like He was very observant of the law, uh, and yet he found something better. What he would say about the gospel was that it was good news. And that's what we should say too, right? I mean, you, you know how it is. When you hear good news, don't you want to tell somebody? Y'all, this is going to embarrass my son, but this week he caught a pass in a scrimmage. I know, a scrimmage, but still he caught a pass. It was a 25-yard run after the catch. He made a, a really great, and man, I just want to tell people, I was showing someone on my phone this morning, I'm that guy, you know? And it's just, it's great news. Like, I want to share it. And the gospel, it's really good news. The Apostle Paul's like, I've got to tell people about this. And y'all, it's not just the outcome of a game. It's not just, you know, a parent bragging on their kid. This is something that has eternal consequences. What Paul realizes is that the gospel has transformed his life. It has eternal implications, not only for him, but also for the whole world. And when he heard this good news that Jesus Christ had died on the cross for his sins, that he was buried and he rose again on the third day. Jesus is like, I saw him in the flesh. He is real. This is eternal. It's significant. Paul gave his life to taking the gospel to people that hadn't heard. The first thing that motivated Paul, that influenced him, was divine revelation. Paul met him who is the way, who is the truth, and who is, to, who is the life. And what Jesus said about himself in John 14, 6, I'm the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father except by me. The Bible, which Paul tells us is the word of God, divine revelation, um, makes very exclusive claims about Christianity. What Jesus says is there's not another way for people to be saved. And as we think about that as the people of God, and we think about that globally, Billions of people in this world that have not yet heard. And, and there's no other way to be saved for people to, to get to uh, come to know Christ and spend eternity with the Father. Um, this is motivating Paul. He's like, listen, I've received this good news, but man, I've got to start sharing it. And he gave his life to making Jesus Christ known. This is the message of eternal consequence. Now, we live in a world today that as people think about you know, you got decisions to make, uh, priorities to set. 
uh, the, the adage that is often given or you might hear in our culture is when you're trying to make a decision is you might hear people say, well, follow your heart. Be true to yourself. And what do you really want to do? What do you really desire? And that's what you should pursue. That's the message that is like repeated over and over and over throughout our culture. Follow your heart. Well, the problem with that, the prophet Jeremiah tells us this in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. He tells us this. He says, the heart is deceitful above all things. It is desperately sick. So now think about the people that you know in your life, the people that we're surrounded with, people around the world. What they're doing and what they're constantly being told in, in, in terms of the decisions they make, the priorities they set, what is good, what is right, what is true. Well, just follow your heart. Well, if you're seeking that which is true and right and good, but you're listening to your heart which is deceitful, you're in a really bad place. But church... Here's God's plan for the world because God wants to redeem the world. He wants to save the world. He has his church and he's given us the gospel. He has revealed himself to us in his word. He is the way, the truth, and the life, right, that we might get to share this good news, this gospel with the world. That's what Paul is doing. He's giving himself to spreading the gospel to people that need to hear. They need to come to know him who is the way and the truth and the life. The only way that they can come to know the Father. Why would you leave living life perfectly in the first century, killing it as much as you could in order to endure suffering? It's because the Apostle Paul had received divine revelation. Last week we looked at 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 where Paul spells this out to us. It says that all Scripture, all of the Bible, this is what we believe, is God breathe. It's theonoustos. It literally means breathed out by God. Now we recognize scripture was written by human authors, but we believe they were inspired by the Holy Spirit to write down the words that we have. When we share the Bible, the truth of the scriptures, we're not pointing people to an ancient document. It's not good advice. These are the very words of God. Now, one of our our values as a church, if you've been here very long, you're going to hear us say this, but we are unapologetically biblical. We are going to teach to you what the Bible says. I have my thoughts, y'all. I have opinions, and I think they're generally right, or else they wouldn't be my opinions, right? I would change them. Um, But those things do not compare with the inspired Word of God. Jesus is the way. He is the truth. Truth isn't just an idea. It's a person. And Jesus has revealed himself to us in his Word. So as we think about what we're going to teach here, And and, and on this stage or in children's ministry or in your small group, we want to teach unapologetically the words of God. Because they are good and they are right and they are true. They are the way and the truth and the life. And if we want to point people toward that which is good, we want to give them good news, we give them the word of God. And you too should never apologize for believing what the Bible says or for sharing with other people what the Bible says is true. Because what we're doing is we're inviting them into God's abundance. All of the teaching of Scripture, every commandment, everything we see, it's really an invitation to know Jesus. It's an invitation to live out His abundance. So the first thing that we see here, life-changing for the Apostle Paul, the thing that changed the trajectory of his life. He received divine revelation, the message of the gospel. Jesus Christ died on the cross for his sin. He was buried and he rose on the third day, victor- the third day victorious over sin and death. Now, the second thing that happened to the Apostle Paul, in which you may have experienced, it was a divine intervention. Sometimes in the church we talk about our but God moment. Uh, and maybe you, you have this. I was living my life, I was doing my thing, I was going my own way, I was pursuing a career in whatever it was. Man, I wanted to make a million dollars, I wanted to be famous, I wanted to have this view. Maybe you're just pursuing the American dream, but somewhere in there you met Jesus. Like God intervened in your life and it began to change your priorities and the things that you pursued. Look what the Apostle Paul says in verse 13. Writing to the churches, he's like, I know I've got a reputation, y'all. For you have heard of my former life in Judaism. This is what the Apostle Paul was pursuing with his whole heart. He was all in on Judaism. 
You heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently, and I tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. I was so extremely zealous, was I, for the traditions of my fathers, that I, I was willing to go the whole way and persecute the church. And then, and then there's, here's this moment. But... But when he who had set me apart before I was born called me by his grace. This was a divine intervention in Paul's life. I, I don't know how familiar you are with the, how Jewish boys would have been taught in the first century. But when they were about six or seven years old, they would enter into uh, the Talmud school. And the, in this school, they would really, they taught them scripture and they taught them tra tradition, Jewish traditions. And so they would begin by memorizing a verse every single day. From the time that they were about five or six, even to the time they were 12 years old, they're learning scripture all day, every day, right? They are about it. And these young boys would learn huge portions of scripture. Like they would start with the first five books of the Old Testament. And if they could progress beyond that, they would begin to learn the prophets as well, the law and the prophets, now, when they were about 12 years old, um, the boys would then be able to leave school. They would go work with their dads or have a normal job. But those who were the most gifted, those who could memorize the scriptures and seem to have the best grasp of the traditions of Judaism, they would actually continue on in school. This happened with the Apostle Paul. He was one of those gifted ones. He was one of those that got it. He was actually trained up under a rabbi by the name of Gamaliel. And as a result, because his rabbi was really famous, the Apostle Paul had made a name for himself too. He was a Hebrew among Hebrews, a Pharisee among the Pharisees. When he walked into the room, people listened. And he was so zealous for Judaism and for keeping the law that when people came out and said, Hey, I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm a follower of the way. Man, I met him who is the way, the truth, and life, and I'm living according to him. Paul says, I began to violently persecute the church. Now, this wasn't name-calling and giving people bad looks, right? It wasn't sneering when they went by. The Apostle Paul was all in on persecuting the church. He would imprison, have men and women thrown in prison for following Jesus, he would, he would oversee the public beating of Christians. And sometimes we're like, you know, it was 2,000 years ago and, and we lose the impact. But I want you to imagine that somebody in your home is in prison because they believe the gospel. Because this man, the Apostle Paul, was so zealous for Jewish traditions, he would put your family in prison. Or you had to stand by and watch as they were beaten over and over and over again. The Apostle Paul even went so far. That he stood by nodding in approval as a man was put to death for daring to believe in Jesus. That's where the Apostle Paul was. He says, that's the race I was running. That's what I was pursuing. But God, when he called me, who had set me apart before his birth and who called me by his grace. Remember, we're saved by grace alone through faith in Jesus Christ alone. And when God called me, things changed. That Apostle Paul, who was really busy persecuting the church, was actually, he was traveling a road headed toward Damascus. He has letters in his hand from the religious leaders that gave him permission to put even more Christians in jail. But as he traveled on that road, he saw a blinding light. It's so bright that he, he's unable to see anymore and he falls to the ground and he hears a voice from heaven and the voice asked him, Saul, which is, by the way, his name before God changed it to Paul. He says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And man, this is sobering, especially as people who might know the Bible. Maybe you were raised in church, went to Sunday school. He asked a question that should really kind of cut us deep and make us question whether we know him. He said, who are you, Lord? And he could quote most of the Old Testament he knew the scriptures. He was like a, a, as advanced in Judaism as you can get. He would have been able to outquote any of us. Like, out, like in terms of knowing the Bible, he knew it better than we did. But he didn't know the God of the Bible. And that's a real danger for us, right? Because we're accustomed to church. Our granny took us when we were a kid. That we, we could kind of be well-versed. And we could have the conversations within the body here when we gather on Sunday. But we might not know God. He said, who are you, Lord? 
And then Jesus responded, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and I'm going to show you what must be done. This was a divine intervention in the life of Paul. He knew the scriptures. He'd heard it all before. But in this moment, he came to meet the risen Savior. He, his eyes were opened. He began to see the way, the truth, and the life. Like he'd never seen it before. He came to know Jesus Christ. His life was forever transformed. Now, I, I don't know about you, but if I'd been knocked to the ground by a bright light and heard a voice from heaven, um, that would be meaningful to me. And I don't know that that will be our experience. If it is, we need to write a book, right? We'll talk about that. But God has a way of revealing himself to us, just like he did the Apostle Paul. And, and there's this, this understanding that comes. Look what he says here in verse 15. He says, but when he who had set me apart before I was born. And what we see here is that when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, we often think it happened in a moment. You know, like there was this moment and Jesus revealed him, road to Damascus, right? But what we see is that Jesus had been pursuing Paul for a lot longer than he'd ever realized. Maybe you're here today and you don't know this, but Jesus Christ has been pursuing you since even before you were born. Now there's this big question as we read this text that you might be asking. Why do you think God would choose to save a guy like Paul? He was putting Christians to death. He was responsible for them being beaten and thrown in prison. Why in the world, of all the people in the world, why would he, God choose to save the apostle Paul? Well, the good news is that Paul tells us the answer to that. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, he says, This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. He's like, man, this might be a little hard for you to grasp or understand, but it's true. That Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. Paul's like, listen, <clears throat> I know you might have done some things. You, you, you might have sinned in some pretty big ways. You, you might have gone some places, hung out with the wrong people. You might have a rap sheet of sorts. Like you might be a pretty good sinner, but you got nothing on me. I'm the biggest. I'm the guy that put Christians to death. I'm the reason people were beaten and imprisoned and families were separated. It was because of me. And he's like, why in the world would God choose to save me? And he answers that in verse 16. But I receive mercy for this reason. That in me, as the foremost sinner, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. Paul says, you know why Jesus chose to save the chief of sinners? So that you would know that Jesus is a greater Savior than you are a sinner. So that you would know if Jesus can save Paul, Jesus can save me. If Jesus can save Paul, Jesus can save you. I don't know where you've been or what you've done, what your story is, but I want you to know that Jesus Christ is a greater Savior than you are a sinner. Like, he came to die for you that you might find new life in him. We strive to be a church where it's okay to not be okay. What we recognize is that every single one of you here today, there's a story behind your life. Man, there are struggles. There are difficulties. There is pain. Maybe your life's just a, a big old mess. Well, if that's true, you're in the right place. This is a place where it's okay to not be okay. It's just not okay to stay there. What we believe about Jesus is that he died on the cross for your sins, not only that you might have forgiveness, but that he might begin this work where he makes you brand new, where, where your sin can be forgiven and your life can be redeemed, where hope can be restored, where the power of God can be displayed in your life. Paul goes on, if you read down here in verse 20, 23, um, he reveals to us what God does. He takes the mess of our lives and he makes it our message. Look what he says. He says, um, people have been hearing about Paul. Um, he says, they were only hearing it said, he who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. Do you remember that guy who used to have us drug off and put in prison or beat? The guy who gave approval when men were stoned to death were believing? The man who once tried to destroy us is now preaching the faith that he once tried to destroy. And then in verse 24, and they glorified God because of me. Paul's like, that big old mess of my life, 
that thing that I was so ashamed of, man, that life where I did damage to the church and other people, man, God has taken that and he's using it for his glory. I love regeneration in our church. It's our recovery ministry. And I want you to know it is not just for people who, who have done those things or are caught up in it. is for those people too, but it's not just for those people. Uh, regeneration is for people like you and me. I wish every person in our church would go through it. It's for people with hurts and habits and hangups. And here's what we all realize uh, in the midst of regeneration or as we come to grips with our sin. Man, we realize that all of our lives are a mess but that God wants to take that mess and turn it into our message. You may not know this about us, but we are a church full of liars and cheaters and thieves. You may not want to hang out with us after this, but it's true. We are a church of addicts and adulterers and abusers. We are full of self-centered, self-absorbed, self-interested sinners who are all being transformed by the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Man, he is redeeming us like nobody here has it all together. Um, But what we're doing is saying, by the grace of God, we want to know Jesus and we want to be transformed by him. Paul's like, you want to know why I left the life behind? And it was. It was a good life. I was living well. Why would I leave it behind? Man, I I received divine revelation. I understood the truth of the gospel. Jesus divinely interrupted my life. There was this moment where everything changed for me. And I couldn't help but follow him. And he's transformed me. There was this divine intervention that changed everything. And then the final thing that I want you to see today is that Paul received a divine commission. Look what he says in verse 15 when he talks about receiving the grace of God. He says, But when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me, When God revealed his son to me, that wasn't all that he did. Um, There was a reason that God did this in my life, and it's a purpose clause in verse 16. It says, in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles. Man, you're not just God's project, where God just wants to save you and then kind of leave you on your own, just kind of make it through this life and hopefully get to heaven one day. What God wants to do is it invites you to his great big plan in this world, which is to make him known among the nations. Now, I'm not saying you have to go across an ocean. This may involve you just going across the street. Um, But God doesn't just want to display his power in you. He wants to display it through you as you go out and begin to participate in this work that God is doing in the world. Listen, Jesus loves you. He knows your name. He knows the number of hairs on your head. He knows your struggles and your pains and your hurts. He knows your sins. And he's seen it all. And he still chose you. You need to know that God loves you. But God doesn't just love you, right? God loves the world so much that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him wouldn't perish but would have everlasting life. Now, In Psalm 139, the psalmist tells us something about ourselves. Paul brings this out. He says, but when he who had set me apart before I was born, Paul's like, listen, God had a purpose for my life before I even realized it. It wasn't just true of Paul. It's also true of you. Listen to what the psalmist says in Psalm 139. He says, for you, talking about God, you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Can you just maybe receive that from the Lord today? You were fearfully and wonderfully made by the God of the universe who doesn't make mistakes. I'm not saying you haven't fallen into sin. You don't experience that in your life. But you were fearfully and wonderfully made by the creator of the world. He said, wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance, and in your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me when as yet there was none of them. God was writing your days in his book before you took your first breath. 
In your mother's womb, he knit you together. He made you as you are, intricately woven. He made you as you are, on purpose and for a purpose. And it's not just that you would receive his grace. Man, praise God for his grace that we receive. But he also made you that you might communicate his grace, that you might express his grace and his goodness to the world around you. Y'all, I'm not a a great mechanic. I've, I've actually been having some mower trouble lately, and I have a three-acre lawn, <clears throat> so it's a real problem. Uh, so I've been diligently working. I've spent hours and hours and hours working on my lawnmower that when I parked it last, it ran fine, but now it won't start. And so I'm not the best mechanic, but you might be impressed. I decided to check the battery, right? Maybe if the mower won't start, it's the battery. And so I went and I checked the battery. Uh, 12.7 volts were, were good there. And I'm like, okay, battery's good. Maybe it's the starter and the solenoid. And so I did my best to test those. Finally, I took them out of the mower, connected them to the battery. Sure enough, boom, starter sings. It's like everything should, should be working. But for whatever reason, when I turn the key, the engine, uh, the starter doesn't engage and the engine doesn't start. And I'm like, man, something's going wrong here. I'm like, wait a second. There's power at the battery. The starter works. Maybe power isn't getting to the starter, and that's the problem. And so I, I tested What's my voltage at the starter? Is it getting there? And sure enough, in truly infuriating fashion, the battery's good, the cable between the battery and the starter's good, the starter's good, but it still doesn't work. And I have, listen, I have racked my brain. I'm clearly out of my league in terms of fixing my mower. Um, But I think I know what the problem is. You see, a starter doesn't run merely because you supply power to it. The starter runs when electrical current runs through it. And so there's something on the back end of that circuit. There's a disconnect somewhere in my electrical system, which is maddening, by the way, that is keeping uh, current from flowing through that starter and obviously starting the engine and everything working fine. There's a disconnect somewhere. And for many believers, the same is true. Like you might find that you look around and you're like, gosh, I see that God seems to really be at work in his life or in her life, and I'm not experiencing that. Man, look at the power of God being displayed through that person, but it's not happening in me. Here is the message. God does not just intend for his power to, to be delivered to you. He intends for it to flow through you onto other people. Like Paul's like, I received this divine commission in my life that I might preach the gospel to the Gentiles. Like I'm not just supposed to hang out here on this earth for all these years. And you might find that in this life you get a little bit bored. Like going through the motions, you're like, why am I going to work every day? Why am I enduring all that I have to endure? This doesn't feel very abundant. This doesn't feel like the life I'd always wanted. Well, listen, you were created to join God in his mission to take the gospel to the nations. You know, that intellect that you have, maybe really talented or you're really gifted, and maybe you've been using those things to build your own kingdom here on this earth. And maybe you found that that's pretty empty. That as soon as you accomplish one thing, you're on to the next. And it's the next and the next and the next. Well, listen, God didn't just give you those abilities, that intellect, those gifts for you to use for you, right? He intended for those things to not just be utilized for your kingdom, but also to build his. His power and his gifts should flow through you and not just to you. Some of you guys, man, you are talented in business. You connect with people like you're just fantastic at, at making a bunch of money or maybe you've been given a position of prominence or a power. You get to influence people. Well, listen, that wasn't just for you, right? It wasn't supposed to terminate with you. As a matter of fact, it was supposed to flow through you that you might leverage those things for the kingdom of God. Paul's like, you want to know why I would leave all of that stuff behind and give my life to suffering that people might hear the gospel? It's because God has commissioned me for this. It's because before I was even taking my first breath, God had made me for this. It was true of Paul and it's true of us that God designed you exactly the way he designed you. With your gifts and talents and abilities, man, he's given you your networks and your friends, not merely that you could use those gifts to build your own kingdom, but that so that you could leverage them to build his. And we have all been sent by God, to be used here in this world to make him known and to enjoy him as as we're in the midst of that process. And so, listen, Jesus saved you by grace alone, through faith alone. And now he has equipped you, he has commissioned you 
to go out and to make him known among the nations. So what drove Paul to do what he did? To give his life for the sake of the gospel. He had received divine revelation, the truth of the gospel. There was a divine intervention in his life where God absolutely transformed him. In a moment, God revealed himself to Paul, and his life was forever changed. And then Paul received God's divine commission in his life. Now, maybe you're here today, and you're like Paul. Grandma took you to church. You can quote some verses. You, you know, like the church lingo, you can function pretty well in a crowd. And you're like, you know when to say amen or why we call each other brother. And, you know, like you kind of get the church stuff. Maybe you're like Paul and you have some biblical knowledge, but you've never actually come to know Jesus. And maybe you're here and you recognize that God is revealing himself to you. He's drawing your heart to him that you might know him who is the way and the truth and the life. And if that's you today, in just a minute, I'm going to pray and then I'm going to be down here. I would love to visit with you about what it means to believe the gospel and to become a disciple of Jesus Christ. Let me just encourage you, surrender your life to him. You will never regret it. Jesus is the one person who's worth giving up everything that you might know him and be found in him. Now, maybe you're here today and you've been treating the word of God, the scriptures, more like good advice you get from your friends. You know, y'all probably have some friends who are wise and uh, other friends that are not as wise. And, you know, as they kind of give you advice in your life, you're like, I'm going to take that. I'm going to leave that one behind. And some of you, that's how you treat the word. It's like good advice. And rather than saying, these are the very words of God, this is God's invitation to true abundance in my life. If I want to know fullness of joy and fullness of life, I will surrender my whole life to Jesus and live in obedience to him. Maybe it's time to repent of some of those sinful patterns where you're walking in things that the scriptures clearly say are sinful. And you, today's the day that you just repent and say, God, I'm not going to walk in that. By your power and your spirit, may I turn and begin to follow you and live out the abundance according to the truth of your word. Maybe you're here today and your life is a mess. And Maybe people know that and maybe they don't. You would be absolutely blown away by the number of people who can put on a smile and a, a, a clean shirt and show up to church and, and, and make it through the day. Listen, if your life is a mess, don't pretend anymore. And maybe you're here and God's begun to work in your heart even today to reveal that. That he wants to turn your mess into a message. Man, he wants that, that you could tell the story like the Apostle Paul. That, man, there's now people glorifying God because of me. He wants to redeem and to restore that which is broken. He wants to bring healing and health to your life. Man, I just want to invite you to trust him. And, and maybe that looks like beginning in regeneration. And maybe that means that you just stop and confess your sin to someone in your row. Or you come up here. But man, don't, don't struggle with your mess anymore like Jesus wants to set you free. And then the final thing here, maybe you're hearing God is calling you to begin to participate in his great commission that we might go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything he has commanded you. And maybe that looks like you beginning to leverage your gifts and your talents and your abilities for the sake of God's kingdom, saying, God, here am I. Send me. Use me. Whatever I have, God, is yours. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to begin to invest my money or my gifts or my time. I'm going to invest it in your kingdom to be used for your glory. I don't want your power just to, to come to me and then stop. I want to see it flow through me that other people might know. And maybe you're here and God is calling you to that unique role where God would call you to begin to serve. Maybe it's in, in the full-time vocational missions or ministry or you'd say, man, I'm going I'm to go overseas and I'm going to take the gospel to people that need to hear. I want to be like the Apostle Paul. I'm gonna, I mean, I'm willing to put it on the line and leave my whole life behind to follow him. If that's you today, I would love to pray with you and visit with you more about what that looks like uh, and how our church can get behind you and, and support you. Today I'm going to ask that you would bow your heads with me and just, just pray the prayer, God, what are you asking me to leave behind? God, what are you asking me to take up today? And then respond in obedience to him. Father, we thank you for the life of the Apostle Paul. We're thankful for your power that's been demonstrated in his life that the chief of sinners has come to faith in Jesus. And now uh, we glorify you because of your work that you did in his life. 
And God, I pray that that story would be uh, written over and over and over again with, with the name of every person that's in this place today, that people would glorify you because of what you've done in their lives. God, help us to respond in obedience and humility and in submission to you. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand uh, during this time of invitation?